The selection committee is pleased to name Dr. Adel Rosemann a 2019 Fredericks A. Howe Scholar in Computational Science. Dr. Rosemann received his PhD in Biomedical Informatics from Harvard University in 2018 and is lead engineer for machine learning at in situ, a startup focused on drug discovery via that technology. Adam was selected for his demonstrated leadership, character, and outstanding technical achievements in computational science. Adam's doctoral research focused on developing state-of-the-art machine learning methods to predict the effects of genetic variation. These techniques are necessary to employ genetic sequence data in identifying mutations that affect disease. Specifically, Adam led a project to develop novel variational autoencoders for genomic sequences that allow for interpretation of mutation effects. By summarizing billions of years of information, evolution, these data-driven models are sensitive enough to predict the single mutation's impact on gene function. On his own initiative, Adam investigated the data integrity question in his practicum project at Ber uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, identifying previously unknown problems in a subset of the data. In the process, Adam built a new automated sequence analysis workflow that jointly identifies mutations with high sensitivity from next-generation sequencing data, while at the same time inferring functional consequences of such mutations. Adam's approach and vision set a strong precedent for the importance of careful data curation and for developing models for model methods for model interpretation. Researchers continue to use his generalizable analysis framework in other projects. Adam has demonstrated technical excellence, attention to detail, and vision as a scientist, and developed new tools capable of handling terabytes of genetic sequence data. He has created highly innovative machine learning techniques that are at the forefront of computational biology research today. His results have been published in top journals, including Nature Me Methods, Cell, the International Conference in Learning Representations, and Nucleic Acids Research. Adam has also distinguished himself as the type of leader who makes every around him, everyone around him better, frequently volunteering his time to the benefit of others in his profession. In graduate school, Adam strove to make the laboratory a collaborative, welcoming, and open environment, generously sharing his time mentoring and explaining new or difficult concepts to his fellow graduate students. Adam helped arrange career fairs for the Health Professions Recruitment and Exposure Program, an outreach organization for underprivileged high school students in the Boston area that exposes them to careers in science and computational biology. Adam served as a scientific writer, editor, coordinator, and lecturer for Science in the News, a Harvard graduate student organization that conveys important scientific issues to the general public while training members as effective scientific communicators. Finally, Adam was instrumental in creating a series of teaching sessions about the latest methods in machine learning for his research group, to the enormous benefits of his fellow graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and the research faculty. Adam is a computational scientist who not only excels technically, but also serves as a role model for others as both a researcher and a human being. He embodies the qualities that Fred Howe has promoted in all early career scientists. Let's congratulate Adam. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sarah, for this wonderful bio introduction. Um, so my name is Adam Rosenman. Um, just as you mentioned, I was a CSGF fellow at Harvard University from 2014 to 2018. And I did my practicum at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab with the Joint Genome Institute in 2016. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work I did in my PhD, just wrapping up towards the end, as well as some that we're working on right now at Encitro, the drug discovery startup in the Bay Area. So I'm going to focus on one of the core problems that we focus on in biology. And this is building maps from genotype to phenotype. So when we make a mutation in, or discover a mutation or make a mutation in a genome, how do we predict if this mutation is going to be beneficial or deleterious? Building this map is really, really complicated. And there's a lot of nonlinear interactions that occur. And just trying to make that map is a fundamental challenge of biology. But first, just to get everybody on the same page, I just want to break down the central dogma of biology and kind of going from genotype to phenotype. What exactly does that mean? So as most of you remember, there, all the instruction of life is encoded as DNA. These are four individual bases, A, C, G, and T, that make up every one of us. There's about three billion bases in each of our genomes, and it encodes life from the smallest, smallest microbe to us, to giraffes, to gray whales. And so this DNA is the instruction book for, booklet for life, and it encodes RNA. And this RNA can be thought, part of it as someone as a messenger, that also has four different bases, A, C's, G's, and U. This is translated into proteins, which are 20 different amino acids. And these fold up into really complicated shapes that have some specific function. I like to think of proteins as the workhorses of the cell. They go in and they perform functions. They're little machines that do stuff. 
And then, as I mentioned before, they have these complicated functions. So one of the, an example of a protein is the protein that's turning your lunch right now into the energy that you are using to stay awake, hopefully. Or the, um, the oxygen that's going from the air and throughout, circulating throughout the blood. These are some of the functions that proteins have. And so mutations can alter this biological function in building this map. And there's a lot of things that can go haywire. As Sarah mentioned, there can be some RN changes in RNA expression due to mutation. There can be changes in protein expressions due to mutations, as well as those actual coding variants that I mentioned earlier. So predicting the effects of mutations is really, really important for biology. It can be used in the clinic for understanding disease. Many times we want to know, is this mutation going to cause cancer? And if we can pinpoint the exact causes of cancer or some other disease, we can better treat it with precision medicine. It can also be used for biomedicine. If I want to design an antibody that goes into a patient, I want to make sure that it's stable, it's not going to elicit immune response, and we can do that by tuning the biologics through the protein sequence. And finally, it's useful in bioengineering. So many of these enzymes can encode reactions that create vitamins or other essential forms of um, things we take in for life, and we can do some sort of bioengineering to make sequences better. So this is a really hard problem, and we as biologists like to think about it as some sort of fitness landscape, where some f the sequences that we observe out in the wild are these fit se sequences at the top of this fitness peak, and all these unfit sequences are all over, and we barely ever observe them. Now, the problem is, is that sequence space is really, really, really big, like exponentially big. There's a nearly infinite number of sequences that, you know, you could just code up into DNA, but don't do anything. So how do we rectify this data for kind of making some understanding of biology? And this is such a hard problem because it can be sparsely sampled. If I want to try out a therapeutic in myself, it's not like I can make a thousand clones of me and try out the drug in those thousand clones. Just can't do it. Sometimes there's nonlinear interactions between multiple mutations. This data can be really, really, really noisy. There can be confounding factors. And sometimes we just can't even measure the thing that we're looking for due to the constraints of the experiment. So in part one, I'm going to talk about some of my PhD work that uses computational methods to build maps from genotype to phenotype. And just to put everyone on the same page again, um, bringing back up the central dogma, DNA, RNA, RNA to protein, protein to structure, structure to function, I'm going to focus on proteins and the sequences right here. And I'm going to argue that... Uh, uh, so when we're looking for mutation effects and trying to understand them, imagine that we have an individual mutation in the sequence. Here, I have a glutamatic acid that's mutating to a leucine, and it's going to change its function. But if I have another sequence that's mutating the same glutamic acid to an isoleucine, for example, how is that going to change function? How do we predict that? How can I go from sequence to predicting function? And I'm going to argue that um, this has been built up by advances in high-throughput data analysis and advances in machine learning as well. We're able to easily and quickly sequence thousands and millions of organisms relatively quickly and cheaply, and it's becoming much more efficient. Now, once we have this data, how do we make any sense of it? We can employ machine learning models that can automatically find organizational structure in these sequences to answer questions about the tolerance of mutation effects, to understand the organizations of genomes, and predict where mutations are going. So DNA sequencing is really cheap and really easy, and it's only getting cheaper and easier. So imagine I have some collection of organisms that I'm interested in. I can isolate their DNA and then perform some sort of sequencing of them. So here's an example of an Oxford nanopore, and it works just like strings, beads on a string. So imagine you have some really long string, and it has beads on it. You run them through your hand, and you can just measure, is this an A, a T, an A, or a T, C, T, T? And you can just line that up and throw it in some of these large sequence databases. So this is the um, Unipro, one of the databases that I used um, during my PhD, and it has an exponential increase in the number of sequences that are being deposited. 
this stuff isn't going away, and we're going to have to figure out new algorithms to store that data, access that data, as well as build models on top of that data. So if we are interested in an individual protein and understanding mutations effects, let's say it's protein X, which is implicated in some disease, most times there are other homologous examples of that protein. So not only do humans have those enzymes that turn food into energy, but maybe whole bunches of other organisms have that as well. And so we can think that all of those other examples of that enzyme in public sequence databases are functional examples of that sequence. So we can look into databases just like the Joint Genome um, Institute provides. And I like to think of it as natural evolution is an experiment in parallel. Over the course of billions of years, we've seen a common ancestor divide, multiply, and differentiate into different ecological niches. When a um, organism mutates and that mutation is not tolerated, the organism dies. But if that mutation is neutral or it can potentially even be beneficial, it exists. We've sequenced it and it's placed into a public sequence database. And so if we have this underlying question of trying to understand the impacts of mutations for person A and person B, we're still left with the question of how do we utilize that data? How do you use these public sequence databases to leverage the understanding of mutations and build predictive models? And it's gonna to help to help formulate this problem and thinking about it mathematically. So a lot of us can think about context and probabilistic um, context in the context of natural language processing. So if I were to throw up an English sentence like, we are going to go to the blank, a probably improbable answer was, we are going to go to the banana. You know, that doesn't make sense. It's an improbable word. We are going to go to the running, also a pretty improbable word. But if I said, we are going to go to the zoo, that makes sense. Why? Because we have an intuition of language that's been built into us for our entire lives, and we understand that there's context dependence in this sequence. Here, my notation is that a sequence is simply a, just a character of words. We can do the same thing in proteins, where there's a length of a protein, and instead of individual words, each of these are individual residues. And so then, using this exact same formulation, I can ask, is a histidine probable at this position? Is a valine probable at this position? Or maybe a threonine is, is probable at this position? These are the sorts of things that we're doing for mutation effect prediction. So we utilize an autoregressive likelihood where the probability of any given sequence is equal to the conditional probability of an individual residue conditioned on those before it. So when I see the sentence, we are going to go to the, it's the probability of zoo is conditioned on the entire sentence before it, and we can get this sort of probabilistic understanding of this sequence. We do the same thing for proteins, where we predict an individual residue conditioned on all those prior. We use a dilated convolutional neural network, which can allow aggregation of long range factors into the prediction of individual residues. So this is a little taster of how these things work. It predicts the next character conditioned on all those prior to it, and it's allowed to aggregate long-range information. Here, this is just a toy model, and it's only showing a little bit of that um, dilation factor, but there's a wide variety of different machine learning models that can utilize an autoregressive likelihood that can aggregate exponentially large um, information. So there's a general framework that we've been using in the Marx lab for predicting the effects of mutation. And step one is we infer a generative model of the family. Some of the first ones that many of you are familiar with is simply an icing model or a POTS model where you fit all sites and pairs of positions. We fit latent variable models for sequences. And I'm also gonna, dis and I also just discussed an autoregressive model. Another example um, would be a hidden Markov model of sequences as well. That's also used quite a bit in computational biology. Next, we want to compute the log ratio for each mutant. So if I'm curious about some protein, I go out into public sequence databases, get a bunch of examples of it, fit a generative model, and when I want to predict the effect of mutations, I ask for its relative probability. This is simply like asking the question, how much does that mutation look like something that I've seen in evolution? If I've seen that sort of mutation before, 
Um, that means that that mutation is most likely probable and it's tolerated. If it's improbable, that means that it is not tolerated at this position. And so this gives us a general intuition and framework for doing unsupervised mutation effect prediction. So this is a really great um, resource because it allows us to make mutation effect predictions effectively for free. It's fast, it works on nearly any protein or RNA, and it's accurate. We can save days, months, weeks, and years running these methods before do, going into the lab and trying out mutation effects. So to evaluate how well our model did, we went out and collected real-world data. Folks are performing these experiments called saturation mutagenesis, where they'll take a protein domain and mutate every single predict, um, position and look at what the effect is in the lab. In this case, this is a PDZ domain, and along the x-axis are different positions, and along the y-axis are different um, amino acids that it's changed to. If it's blue, the mutation is not tolerated. If it's white or pink, that means that mutation is tolerated. We then compared these effect predictions to the log probability ratios that I calculated before and compare these two distributions. And so what we're showing is that this um, rank correlation coefficient corresponds rather well with a really large variety of proteins, including those that are implicated in antibiotic resistance, those that are used quite frequently in industrial applications, also those that are implicated in cancer. These are oncogenes that, um, when mutated, may drive cancer, and we can use these sorts of evolutionary studies to help make those predictions without having to go into the lab. One of the exciting bits about using a neural network powered um, autoregressive model is that we can expand the types of predictions that we're making. Previously, we'd only be able to understand the impacts of missense mutations. In some sort of icing or POTS model, we can only mute change an individual residue, but it's not like you can throw a whole other column into your data. And so with these neural network powered autoregressive models, we can predict the effects of insertions or deletions, which are ubiquitous in bio biological data that we just quite frankly couldn't deal with before and threw out. So these models are very predictive of the effects of insertions, deletions, and it makes sense when you plot them on the cr crystal structure. The nice part of this is that this in no way relies on crystal structure and only utilizes the ever-increasing evolutionary data that's just increasingly bubbling up in our biological sequence databases. So just to recap really quickly, predicting the effects of mutations is important. It's important for a large number of fields in biology, biomedicine, diagnostics, as well as industrial applications. Increases in sequencing ability is making this even more powerful and even more exciting to move into because we have much more data to build these models to. And finally, generative models are useful in predicting the effects of mutations in an unsupervised manner. What's really exciting about this sort of framework is it allows you to try out many different neural network architectures, try integrating multiple different data types, and pretty much just let your imagination run wild with the types of capabilities that you have here. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I'm working on right now at Incitro, a startup in the Bay Area. Um, it is, was started by Daphne Kohler in 2018, and it aims to create a new paradigm for drug development that uses high quality data sets and data-driven models. What we're really building at Incitro is a data factory, quality data that we can build statistical models on top of, understand batch effects, and perform this at a high enough scale to really leverage the power of computation. We can use these data to design novel, safe, and effective therapies that help more people faster and at a lower cost. So I mentioned previously this kind of local fitness landscape of any individual protein. So if we want to focus on protein, this individual protein, for example, we can't really say anything predictive about other regions of the genome as well as other potential functions of that individual protein. We're kind of stuck with some kind of vague sense of fitness, which is kind of dissatisfying. But as I mentioned before, the sequence space is really, really, really large. There are tons of sequences that we haven't even been able to dream up yet. So if there's some region of sequence space, maybe some mutation on chromosome four that manifests itself in neurons for Alzheimer's disease that occurs in kind of this generalized sequence space over here, 
or if there's some mutation in chromosome 2 that is implicated in T cells and autoimmune disorders, how do we make any notion of that in sequences? How can we reach out into databases to like, find out how functional these data are? You really can't. There, there, there is no way. And this sequence space is you know, impossible to really like, traverse and understand data without making it yourself. So another thing that um, Sarah mentioned a little bit previously is how inefficient the drug discovery pipeline is becoming. So I think we're all really familiar with Moore's law. One of the things that's plaguing drug discovery is Eroom's law, which is the inverse of Moore's law. So the amount of money that we're spending on drugs is becoming exponentially more for the relative numbers of drugs that we get out of the pipeline. Finding drugs is really hard, and finding things that's that work is really difficult. And obviously, we're spending a lot of money on things that don't work too well. Also, this is fundamentally a problem of prediction. If we're trying to target some set of small, or if we're trying to create small molecules for an individual target, at the beginning of this drug discovery pipeline, we might start out with 10,000 compounds. And over the course of the drug discovery process, we winnow it down to one compound. But the failure rate for this is really high. Maybe there are off-target effects. Maybe there are side effects. Maybe this drug just doesn't work the way that we intended, and we have to start all over. So how can we make this better? At Incitro, we're, making, um, the, we're integrating the factors of high-throughput biology and computation to improve the drug discovery pipeline. It starts out with human genetics. There is a large variety of human genetic variation that exists out in this world. We all have the three billion bases that makes us unique. These sequences are linked to some phenotype that we observe. Maybe folks are taller or shorter. Maybe they're predisposed to certain medical conditions. And so what we can do is we can take those sequences and effectively build a regression model that takes us from those genetic sequences to the phenotype and pinpoint the genetic causes of disease. We can also integrate clinical data and longitudinal studies to understand these um, other factors in treatment that can be integrated with human genetics. Next, I mentioned before that we weren't able to really tr make a thousand copies of me and try out these different types of um, experiments. At Incitra, we can. We can take stem cells from, individu from individual populations, essentially all of you in this room, turn them back into um, induced pluripotent stem cells, and then differentiate them into any tissue that, we th that we'd really like. If we'd like to study neurological disorders, we can take stem cells from patients, turn them back into induced pluripotent stem cells, and differentiate them down into neurons, where we can test out thousands of small molecules. We can also engineer perturbations into those cells. So imagine this genetic, human genetic variation that we've identified individual causal variants for disease. We can use advances like CRISPR to engineer that into cell lines to understand the roles of genetics in diseases in individual cell types. Finally, we make these measurements with high content phenotyping. Previously, as I described, we had this kind of vague sense of fitness about individual mutations. In this case, we're able to perform high content microscopy, where just an individual experiment will churn out petabytes of image data. We're also able to do single cell RNA sequencing to have a really high, well-defined um, transcriptomic profile to understand the underlying causes of disease. We then use machine learning to help characterize these phenotypes. Um, for image data, particularly convolutional neural networks are invaluable in understanding um, uh, image data and especially this high content microscopy, as well as understand relationships between these data modalities. We need new statistical techniques that go from this high dimensional image data, that go from high amounts of uh, high dimensional large amounts of single cell RNA sequencing data and find things that co-vary co between them. How do we pinpoint these effects and bring that to the patient? So what's really exciting to me is that we can do thousands of biological experiments in one single experiment. I think it's really exciting that we can test out so many hypotheses really all at once and do essentially about 100 years of biology just in an afternoon. So we have this really sparse landscape of mutations before. 
What we can do is we can then illuminate that landscape with our technology and help develop therapeutics that will push us in the right direction. We can design these therapeutics and interventions that will take patients from sick to healthy. So I'm really excited about biology and computation. I think the confluence of factors of automation, types of omics data that we're able to collect, and the amounts of perturbations that we can introduce into cells make this the prime time to get into biology and computation. And with that, I'd like to thank you and like to thank the CSGF for everything that they've provided me. Um, I've had a really wonderful journey in grad school and I wouldn't be where I am today without the help of the CSGF. And finally, everyone um, at my labs at Harvard or collaborators at UCSF, the Joint Genome Institute in, in Citro. Thank you.